Um, great, the recording has started, so I'll start again. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this um, uh, live Q&A uh, for this incredible documentary, Crip Camp, um, directed by uh, Nicole Noonan and Jen Lebrecht. Um, I am going to run through a few kind of housekeeping announcements um, before we start, um, and, um, and then we'll get into it. Um, I'm going to just put on screen sharing again. Um, I'm really nervous, I think, in part because this is, there are a lot of people here from my Emmy community, but also people from my film community and people from um, all over. So it's, just very, it's a very exciting uh, intersection and um, I'm so glad for this conversation we're going to have. Um, so I'm gonna share the keynote again. Um, I'm going to turn off, sorry guys, the autoplay. Um, and just kind of walk through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, a part of this is that um, accessibility is new, is somewhat new to ME Action. Um, we think a lot about how to make um, our events accessible to our community um, uh, because of their disabilities, but we are new to trying to make our events universally accessible. Um, and so, ah, this is gonna autoplay. Um, so I just wanted to have, be able to have some visual feedback on my um, uh, on my introduction. Um, so this is the Crip Camp Q and A. Um, there's a, the, the kind of key art for Crip Camp. There's um, a young man um, who's uh, being carried by another young man um, at Camp Jeanette. Um and Nicole Newnham and Jim Lebrecht um, uh, and Judy Heeman are our panelists. My name is Jennifer Brea, and I'm going to be moderating. Um, you can join us on Blue Jeans. I think that there are still a few slots left. Um, J.MP forward slash ME Action underscore Crip Camp, which is not easy, but it's better than the numbers. Um, and the link, you can also find the link on our Facebook page, or you can watch on Facebook Live. Um, if you want to ask a question, there's going to be two ways to ask the question. Um, first, Jeans. you can type the question in the chat your box um, on your desktop. Oh, there's a little you. icon. Um, that says chat. Um, it will look a little bit different if you are on um, a mobile phone, um, but um, write your question and um, a moderator will call on you um, and then ask you to unmute yourself to ask your question verbally. Um, you can also write your question on Facebook um, as well, and there'll be someone who's in the room um, kind of monitoring the Facebook Live for questions. Um, in terms of accessibility for um, the deaf or hard of hearing, um, it was our intention to have simultaneous um, ASA, ASL and BSL translation. Um, we then found out that you can actually do captioning on Facebook, but we also wanted people in the room to be able to participate in that way. Unfortunately, um, all we found out only yesterday that we lost the ability um, to receive inbound emails. So all the emails we sent to interpreters, we could not receive any of the replies. So we apologize, it's a work in progress, but um, this presentation will be, our, our discussion will be archived after um, on Facebook and our YouTube pages um, with captions, and it's being live captioned on our Facebook page. Um, obviously live captions that are done automatically are not great, but you can also join in there. Um, and to ask a question, again, use the chat feature on Blue Jeans or comment under our Facebook Live. Uh, last thing I'll say, um, especially for those of you who are new to Blue Jeans, um, if you are in the room, please keep your microphone on mute at all times. Um, oftentimes the mic can pick up on if you're typing or your uh, shirt is rustling. And then um, if a lot of people are doing that at once, it's probably about 100 people on the call, it can really make it difficult. Um, and uh, uh, sorry. Um, and so if you can keep yourself on mute and if um, called on to ask a question, please unmute your audio and then re-mute. So I think that's it. Um, and uh, I, sorry for starting a little bit late. We um, all got onto Netflix party. Um, there are this kind of world of uh, social film sharing online is um, new and obviously a lot of people um, since the start of the coronavirus pandemic have been really 
um, trying to find out ways to connect virtually. Um, and uh, Netflix party apparently is not built for 500 people. <laughs> we had 500 people um, joining the film at the beginning, which is really exciting. But I think we broke we broke the tool. So hopefully there'll be better ones uh, in the future. Um, so I just wanted to make some introductions. We're joined today um, by co-directors uh, Nicole Newnham and Jim Lebrecht. Um, as well as, I don't even know how to describe you, Judy, um, the incredible, just amazing Judy Human. Thank you so much all for joining. Um, and uh, um, Jim Lebrecht um, has over 40 years of experience as a film and theater sound designer and mixer, author, disability rights activist and filmmaker. He sound designed probably half the documentaries that have premiered at Sundance. Um, that might be a slight exaggeration, but it feels that way um, oftentimes, um, uh, including Unrest, um, as well as three of Nicole's films, um, which is actually how they know each other and started working together. Um, some of his previous films include um, the, the Blood of Yingzhou District, which won an Academy Award for uh, Best Short Documentary, Minding the Gap, The Force, um, The Waiting Room. And he also has a great David Lynch story, uh, which he might tell you sometime if you're, if you're lucky. Um, Nicole Newnham um, is an Emmy-winning documentary producer and director, four times Sundance Film Festival alum, and five time, five time Emmy uh, nominee. Um, she uh, co-directed The Revolutionary Optimists, um, I'm not sure which film. She has a huge filmography because she's such an amazing veteran filmmaker. Um, and uh, Judy, as you also met through the film, um, co-founded Disabled in Action in 1970 and has been one of the most galvanizing leaders of the disability rights movement ever since. Um, a past camper and counselor at Camp Jeanette, Judy served as special advisor on disability rights for the U.S. State Department. For more than 30 years, she has been involved uh, internationally working with disabled people's organizations and governments to advance the human rights of disabled people. She also has a new book out called Being Human, an unrepented memoir of a disability rights activist, which you can buy um, on Amazon and I'm sure elsewhere. So go read or listen to it. Um, so welcome everyone again. And um, I think before we start with um, some questions that I have for um, Jim, Nicole, and Judy, I just wanted to give um, the people who are in the Blue Jeans room, I know I've been hearing a lot of um, uh, people talking about some of their reactions to the film, and if you could, um, if someone wants to sort of just raise your hand in the chat box and maybe sort of, we'll pick three people to have, say one, one word or one sentence about kind of what they're feeling now, um, having watched uh, Crip Camp just now. Um, Emma, Emma would like to say something. Yes, please. Yes, Ben? Yeah, Emma, you can unmute your microphone now. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, I just feel incredibly grateful that there are people who fought all these battles before I even got there, um, before I was even born. Um, so that I don't have to fight all of these battles. Thank you so much, Emma, for sharing that. Um, I, we're we're, uh, we're having a, I think someone's accidentally screen sharing. I think Ben will 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 figure that out. Thank you, Emma. Um, I, I thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to say something? Carly, yes, please, Carly, um, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, Jen, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, hi, good to see you, good to see everybody. Uh, I've watched this film twice already, watched it with my son, then watched it with my husband. Um, it is an incredible film. You were all amazingly, profoundly inspiring. Judy, I said married immediately to Terry that I thought you two were twins um, in your activism and to love to see 
amazing work you're doing. I also just want to comment briefly on being a part in a, uh, in a peripheral way to the camp movement, uh, the Jewish camp movement in particular, and seeing how we're working towards inclusion and equity uh, and leadership. To me, that was really, really inspiring. I mean, among the millions of other things as a person with MECFS. So I hope to work to get this film into the camp community as well, because I really do believe that is where the culture of leadership is being cultivated. And I want to spread that more widely. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, and just one, word, one more comment from Maria, if Maria would like to unmute herself. Yeah, thanks. I was just, I sort of tried to write it in the chat box, but it was harder, too hard to put into like typed words. Um, I just noticed that when the one guy near the end with his son talked about how for him it was like freeing that his son um, like didn't see the disability or whatever. And it kind of reminded me of like how I've sometimes felt the opposite, because rather than someone saying, oh, you're disabled, you can't do this. I had, especially early on, a lot more of, you're not disabled, you can do this. Everything okay? You can still yeah, hear we, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry, it, something came on my screen for a minute. Um, and so I just kind of thought that was interesting how like rather than fighting for people to like not see my disability and let me do things a lot of the time at least early on I was fighting for people to see that I was disabled and to let me not do things that I really couldn't do thank you I thank you Maria for sharing that I'm sure a lot of people um, in our community um, and people with other invisible disabilities also have that experience um, so I just wanted to start by asking um, a filmmaking question um, because uh, uh, um, I know a lot of the conversation is probably going to center around the story and um, the activism. And I had the privilege of seeing the film at Sundance um, and Jim and Nicole, like I started crying um, probably like 90 seconds or two minutes in, like before the title card even, which is like not when you intended us to cry, but I cried because I knew that you had nailed it. Like I just, I just, I, I was so gripped by that opening that I was, I just knew it was going to be an amazing film beginning to end and you had just done it. Um, and so I was like so thrilled for you and so heart open. And then my heart just went Psh, and I was this, I was, people around me probably thought something was wrong with me because I was just crying the whole time. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to ask you about how you did that, right? Like, this is an amazing story, but there are so many ways to tell it. And you started off with this incredible archive, um, this amazing music, um, obviously, that um, you assembled. I mean, I, I, was, I was looking at the, the playlists, which we were playing before, and I thought, oh, my God, these songs. Um, and, and I guess I just sort of, and I also really appreciate it, I think, both as a filmmaker as well as an activist, the way you st st structure the story. So for me, I really sort of saw and resonated with this, um, the structure of seeing these journeys from isolation to community and from um, sort of individual story, because what I'm experiencing to self story, that moment when um, a bunch of campers are around a table um, and they're they're sort of talking about their struggles for independence with their parents and you realize that you know they you see them realizing that their experience is an experience that other people are having as well and how that community building and kind of collective storytelling um helped kind of pave the way for the activism for the collective action and so that was really clear in the story structure and i just kind of wanted to ask you like did you know like from the beginning did you have that vision that you ended up with like where did you start um what was that initial intention for the film and what were some of the challenges you faced along the way as you tried to tell the story nicole do you want to start 
Sure. I mean, um, when when Jim first uh, brought up the story to me and we had worked together for about 15 years, he was the sound designer and sound mixer on my previous films. And when he first told me about the camp, um, I was immediately really, really attracted to the idea of it as a film because just his description of the camp itself caused me to shift my thinking about people with disabilities. As a non-disabled filmmaker, I I honestly, like Jim, Jim would often talk about the disability community, but I didn't have a picture of it in my mind, you know? There's so many of the stories and so much of the media out there is, is kind of one person. Um, and so uh, that was from the beginning, I think, an idea that we had that the camp itself could be, um, could paint a portrait of the importance of community. But uh, definitely Jim also had this interesting theory that there was a connection between the profound experience of liberation at Camp Jeanette and the exodus of people that moved out to Berkeley. And, um, and, and yet, you know, it wasn't really until we, you know, called up Judy, which was the very first thing we did as part of working on the film, uh, and started really, you know, talking with other people and investigating things and, and looking at archive. And really, it was a five year process of making the film. Um, so much of the archival was so hard to find. Um, and, and crafting the story in the right way was so difficult. Um, but eventually we did really find our way to a structure that was sort of what we, we talked about, kind of a ripple effect, you know? So Jeanette was sort of like a stone thrown in the water. And then, um, and, and we did from the very first time we saw that scene you mentioned, Jen, of the campers around the table, we did think that the whole first act should build up to that profound moment. And that if we could structure it right, we would see you know, that we would have that feeling of coming into camp through your gym and kind of things coming together. And it's really a testament to some of our brilliant editors um, that we were able to make that work. But um, but then, you know, that that community, it gets bigger in Berkeley and, you, you know, the sort of self-made world gets bigger in Berkeley and then it's recreated again in the building and then you see the, you know, with the ADA. So so that that was the structure we settled on, but it was a um, a collectivist uh, effort making the film. It really, really, truly was um, with the people who are in the film as well as the people who made the film, and um, and we tried always to keep in that idea that we were of that community spirit in the um, in the making of it. No, well, it was absolutely stunning work. How long was the edit? About two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really shows. Um, it really shows. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it's sorry. I'm gonna stop gushing over the film. Um, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, please. Like, I, I, I know I asked like about like three different questions at once, but um, what was the process like for you? And um, sort of, if you can add. Actually, let me ask you this: What was the Sundance Story and Edit Lab like for you? And what was its impact on the film? <sighs> It was, it was an amazing experience, um, and it was actually a really amazing experience on two levels. As you know, um, the lack of access at the Sundance Resort was something that was um, uh, a challenge, and even just finding housing that we could, you know, be at was quite the process that. Um, was difficult because they're all private homes there and condos and none of them are wheelchair accessible. So indeed, through a lot of sleuthing, um, we did find a place not too far away that was accessible. Um, but even the physical layout there, there were just things like there's no ramp here or we need a ramp there. And But because we were doing planning at a time, they installed a ramp onto the stage of the screening room, which was, you know, just wonderful. And it wasn't like they would just put it up for this one thing. It's like it's a permanent part of that theater now. So um, that experience was um, kind of wonderful, kind of knowing that, you know, as some of us are kind of trailblazers or kind of the first ones in the door that, um, you know, if we can make a positive change that makes it easier for other people to come behind us, then, you know, it's worth that struggle. It's totally worth that struggle or that difficulty. The process at the lab, which is this incredible experience in which 
you uh, you get a chance to set up an editing room um, and have these incredible mentors that come in and look at your cuts and talk to you and give you suggestions and such was amazing. Um, Tabitha uh, and Kristen Feely and all the other people at the doc um, side of things uh, really provided a very safe space. It was very important that everybody felt really um, um, supported but safe, that they could stretch, that they wanted this to go well beyond our comfort zones, and that paid off in um, that paid off extraordinarily well in that um, kind of I, my I, I voice guess for you creatively. Like, what did you take away from what did you take away from the mountain? What was the biggest sort of takeaway for you? Well, there was this one day in which we were uh, working on narration, and we decided that we would look at some of the old footage and that I would kind of comment it, because we could take all of this, record it, and then put it into the voiceover in the film, and it would lead us places. And because of that environment, I wound up kind of going on a 45-minute um, Jack Kerouacian you know, stream of consciousness <laughs> that, um, you know, besides having done therapy for 40 years, uh, this was an incredible time to really be able to kind of talk about things. And really, even when I hesitated at times, I felt like it was a very safe space. And and so I took that away that um, being able to kind of really just go go for it, how important and how enriching that is. But I want to say one more thing is that that safe space was something that Nicole and our editors and everybody, we all kind of collectively had throughout the film. And this is the first time I'm making a film. And, and you know, Nicole and I, like she said, have been friends and colleagues for 15 years, but she's been making films for 25 years. And part of our, you know, connection is, is her heart and her ability. And that I really trusted that I could be as frank and open with everybody and that nothing was going to leave the editing room um, and that that things could I, I had a final say in what we wound up doing and that allowed me to really be honest. Well, it sounds like it was an incredible um, uh, and beautiful collaboration and you know, the film is only as good as 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 the collaboration, right? Like you're, you're birthing this project together. And so um, thank you for letting us into a bit of your process. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a, a question of Judy. And I think for me, um, the, the scene, I mean, the scene at camp where, you know, you're organizing all the meals. <laughs> um, I, I, I loved it because, in part, because I knew it was a setup for something coming, and I was like, man, this woman knows how to organize. Um, and, and it was, but it was amazing to see you so young um, having the, those instincts. And obviously, you know, you also went on a journey from Jeanette to where you ended up. But I, I kind of wanted to ask about those leadership qualities where it's like, it's clear you're you're like like you're leading people in a direction. You're a force of nature, but it was also a really democratic uh, environment where you wanted to make sure everybody was heard and oftentimes um, and and included, which required a lot of flexibility um, and, a, and a lot of listening. And you were also, as a movement, able to bring in so many allies from the Black Panthers and the um, you know farm workers and others. And and I just wanted to better understand like how did that happen? Like, how did you learn how to do that? And and was it something in you, something in, in your family and the way that you grew up? Was it Jeanette? Like, how, how did you learn what you needed to learn in order to be able to play the role that you did? You know, the reality is I just learned it by doing. And I'm sure my family had something to do with it. But also, you know, when I first started going to school, when I was nine and I was in the fourth grade and I went to special ed classes. So, you know, 
Nancy Rosenblum and Neil Jacobson and Stevie Hoffman and a guy named Michael Ward. We all went to the same elementary school. And so we met when I was nine and Neil was four or five and Stevie was younger and Nancy, I think, was around my age. But um, at lunchtime, they all needed some assistance with uh, feeding. And there were staff there who could have, you know, fed them. But we kind of all worked together and I would work with them on eating lunch together. And so I think, as you were asking the question, I was thinking about this. I really think that was the beginning of my, A, wanting to listen to everybody because they each had different speech disabilities. And um, I valued what they were saying. And at that age, you know, nine years old, one of the things we were looking at was things like sharing our lunch, you know, and whether or not we wanted to share our lunch. And I have to say, you know, I, I'm Jewish, we didn't eat pork or bacon, but I did taste bacon. I think Stevie Hoffman would have like, I think, like um, bacon and peanut butter sandwiches or something. And I remember snitching a bite of that. Um, but at any rate, I think it was just, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to be friends. And in order to do that, we really had to take time. And I think that just gradually, um, as I continue to do work, you know, with disabled people um, who were my friends, so it wasn't work, you know, we were friends. And then when I went to camp and a number of people were there from camp and other people, it was just something that was really instinctive. And my parents, I think also, you know, they were friends with like Michael Ward's family and Steve Hoffman's parents. And so, you know, they would come over to the house and we all learned, even though my house was very much uh, verbally quick, because we would be very quick at the table. But I think, you know, when Michael and Stevie and whoever came over, you know, things just naturally slowed down because people valued what people had to say. I think that's important. It's really valuing. And I think as we, you know, got older and the demonstrations in New York City, for example, which preceded the demonstrations in uh, San Francisco, you know, that was also very interesting because there was a group of people there who'd been involved with Willowbrook State School for the Mentally Retarded. We don't use that name anymore, but that was the name of the school. And um, th there again was you know, the slow growth of the movement where we moved away from just working with people at, you know, all the polios or all you know, people with muscular dystrophy or whatever it was. We had made a decision earlier on that we wanted to be cross disability. Now, was that like a, we took a vote, and made a decision on it. It just really evolved because of our friends. And I think because Jeanette was that type of an environment, it was just something that grew. As far as how we were able to, you know, expand with uh, the demonstrations and bring all these groups together, I think it was basically, you know, Kitty Cohn and all the people who were working on the demonstrations, because we worked together in 1977 on the Bay Area demonstrations. We were a group of uh, cross disability, but also we'd been involved in many activities with CIL and we worked with the community and the Black Panthers in part got involved because Brad Lomax, who was a part of the demonstration, also um, had been involved with CIL because he had multiple sclerosis. So, and you know, Kitty Cohn really was very big linchpin. She was socialist, she was a um, socialist workers party person and she had done lots of organizing and over the years, with the many activities CIL had been involved with, we'd involved the community. So it was kind of, you know, fully in chits, um, but not in a negative way. It was people really, we weren't afraid of reaching out to people. We really understood that what we were doing um, was not just for us. And a lot in our messaging of things that we would speak about, which you don't see on the film, and I don't even know if it was documented, 
but I know for me and other people, what we continually tried to talk about was why was Section 504 important, not just to disabled people? I think that was always the theme that we had. So all these things that have evolved. And for me, I kind of laughed at the food scene. Actually, I was hysterical at the food scene because, you know, I could see myself repeatedly at different venues where I had that same kind of approach. So it's funny. It's very funny. But, you know, yeah, I think I really gradually felt comfortable with speaking. In the beginning, I didn't feel that way, but, and I think really much of it had to do with um, being with other disabled people where we could support each other about what our different strengths were. Not everybody was a loud mouth like me, but then I couldn't do other things that Kitty and other people could do. And we really valued the cohesiveness of a group. So it sounds like some of those, um, so this, this really, really makes me want to read your book. Um, <laughs> um, <You do. laughs> um, which, yeah, I can do now. I couldn't read books for eight years, so I'm, I'm excited. Um, and I, I think, so just to kind of draw out some of those, those things that I think are really valuable for me and for, I think, other people who are part of our movement um, for, uh, for ME, I think it's, um, you know, it really sounds like, uh, you know, valuing, the, like, the, like the key to a, a, a strong collective is valuing the individual, listening to people deeply, including people, and making sure that everybody tries to approach each other with that culture. Not to say that I'm sure there weren't lots of like arguments and fights and drama and all the things that happen when you bring humans together, but it sounds like that those are really important principles. Um, and and that and that it did evolve, you know. Um, one thing I just want to bracket and maybe we can talk about this more when we go to the audience discussion is just, you know, I think we as a community have felt so um, kind of marginalized and isolated um, in particular by the medical community. And I think in some ways that marginalization, their marginalization of us has been a lot, I think it's played a role in our self-definition, if that makes sense. It's like we've been shut out of medicine and then so we feel very much isolated and very much apart, which is only um, accentuated by the fact that a lot of us can't leave our homes or can't leave our beds or can't even um, tolerate, you know, visual um, or audio um, stimulation. And so, um, uh, but I think what the film really did for me was paint a picture of like, we actually are a part of this much bigger community and uh, the disability community is this huge tent it's very diverse that includes lots of sub communities and and that you know have their own um challenges and 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 issues to fight for and cultures but that there's also a broader disability culture and disability history that we're all a part of right it's like when emma said at the beginning she said thank you so much for fighting for me for all of these things that i have before i was even born and i think i want to say one thing yeah. if i could so for me, you know, in looking over the film again, I mean, Jimmy and Nicole have seen it thousands of times. I've seen it about six. But there's this one scene um, where I am kind of trying to speak and eventually do about being thankful for toilets. And I would say that I don't remember where it was, but I definitely remember um, I had what, what was – what for me is important about that scene was I remember really struggling on talking about toilets. And at some point in the 70s when we were working on 504 regulations, I started talking about toilets because they're symbolic of a number of things. For those of us who need assistance in going to the bathroom beyond just needing a physically accessible space, it's something that we're discouraged from talking about because it's something people don't want to talk about pee or poop or anything. And for uh, people in our movement, there are some people, again, like myself, who can't 
do many of these things alone. And the ability to say something about that was very powerful. And the support that I got from that group, you know, we've got your back, as somebody said, was really very important. So in, in continuing forward on the discussion that you were just leading, um, I think whatever our status is as a disabled person, uh, whether we're not able to get out of bed or we're able to get out of bed, whatever, because things change. Um, it is really being able to articulate your story and to really dig into those aspects of your story that may make you uncomfortable, but also will make other people not intentionally uncomfortable. That wasn't my purpose in saying that or repeating it many times, but it really was to allow people to more graphically and clearly understand some of the real issues that we're dealing with. And I think that's one of the powers of the film, that it really does get to issues that typically are not discussed. And I think that's really important. Um, thank you so much for that, Judy. And I think um, it, it's helpful to hear that in part because, you know, it's hard to appreciate how something might have been taboo when it when you've when you've kind of gone through that process of, of talking about it and making it less taboo. But I think it's interesting to think about what are the things we can bring out of our story that might challenge people and push them to uncomfortable places, but how that might be a way to advocate going forward. And I think that And um, make it normal. Yeah. Like being able to go to the bathroom, nobody thinks about that. Right? Mo the majority of people can go to the bathroom by themselves. They can get to a small stall, a big stall, and it's it's something that everybody does. There is nobody that doesn't have to go to the bathroom, which is why I think, for me, it was something, it still is, something to speak about because people don't want to talk about it, but it is kind of the essence for some of us of what some of the major barriers are. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and so I, I want to transition to getting questions from the audience and to the panelists. I would just say um, we started a little bit late. Um, you, you're welcome to remain for as long as you feel able um, and and leave when you need to. Um, and I'm sure this conversation will will, will keep will keep going because there's a lot that people are putting in the chat that they're digging to here. And I see that you guys have also been replying in the chat, which I appreciate as well. Um, and, and I also just want to sort of invite um, the people in the, in the audience is just sort of, you know, I think we're going to have future conversations together as a community um, uh, around this question of how do we, as an ME community, join the disability community in, uh, in a bigger way and support these broader causes um, and, and learn about other communities while also still advocating for our own. So I'm, I'm going to kind of put that to the side, but it's something that I really, um, uh, I thought a lot about after watching the film, and it really, it really um, gave me, um, yeah, a very different vision um, for how we might all move forward. So, um, Ben, you've been monitoring the chat. Um, Lori, you've been monitoring the Facebook Live. Do you guys have some uh, questions that um, we should ask uh, our panelists? Um, yeah, we have lots of questions. Uh... So I think one would be, uh, I see a question uh, um, from uh, Terry. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Um, uh, Terry, so, go ahead. Great, can you hear me? Thanks, um, everyone, for being part of this. Um, Judy, earlier, um, someone mentioned me to you. Um, when they saw the film, they thought we were twins. Um, so I think we have a twin uh, personality. So I think we're twin activist sisters. Honestly, um, um, Terry, when I was watching the film, I thought of you when I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I don't know if it's because we both wear glasses. I don't know if you know, it's because we're like, take charge, put down the Hamlet. <laughs> um, but so my question is actually for Judy and Jim. Um, and it's really a shout out to kind of the whole process. Um, when I got 
diagnosed with ME, I was working on my PhD in sociology and I was so close to being finished. I think there's something about finishing your PhD that makes you get ME. I'm not sure what the connection is. Um, but my concentration was in gender and sexuality. Um, so first of all, thanks to the filmmakers for addressing sexuality um, in the movie. Um, I'm sure everybody who's involved with this realizes that people often police our bodies in a variety of ways. So I really appreciate that shout out about sexuality. Um, so for Jim and Judy, why do you think that people um, think that we aren't sexual and that they have a right to police our bodies around sex and critique us in terms of how we have sex, who we have sex with, um, or that we wanna have a family? Um, so that's part one of my question. And then I'm also wondering if you can speak about the camp in terms of it being a safe space for people with a variety of sexual orientations, like if people who were gay or bisexual or lesbian were there, did they feel safe being there? Um, also, you know, I'm just curious if any transgender people ever came to camp. So I kind of have a two part question. Judy, do you want to start that off? Sure. Um, first of all, remember the camp was in the 60s and this is 1971. So to the best of my knowledge, there were no people identifying as transgender. Uh, I know that there were some people there who were gay, but quite frankly, were not out. There might have been some people who were out, but one of the guys, um, you know, at the camp who was pretty prominent, not a disabled guy, um, but he was gay and he kind of hid that a substantial amount of his life. Uh, so I think, you know, we need to put this all in the context of the era that things were happening. Um, as far as why people feel that they have a right to um, control our sexuality or uh, judge or restrict what we're going to do. I don't think it's anything different than what people feel overall about their ability to direct and control our lives. So, you know, sexuality is something where I think, you know, your one is in many cases more expressive and it's a part of who one is. And that ability of being able to be expressive and be sexual and not necessarily be private, but be able to be, in this case, like other teenagers. Um, I think, you know, in the general world, um, certainly there were disabled individuals who were um, sexually active. Um, I just think it's an overall issue around oppression, you know, and um, at, at that time there was a program at University of uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, where they got a federal grant, which I, I tell stories about this, and I laugh all the time because I would never see a grant like this being given in today's environment. Basically, it was a grant that was given to do counseling around sexuality. Um, and it did include, you know, straight people, gay people, disabled people. It was very mixed. And I think that program was really amazing because disabled people were equal members of this community that were being trained on how to do counseling with sexuality as a significant part of the discussions. It's the only time I've seen that kind of a program. But I think in, in reclaiming our lives, um, A, for people who are acquiring their disabilities, I think being able to be in touch with um, who they are and whether their sexuality was something that was important to them prior to acquiring their disability and wanting to be able to maintain that. Then I think the other issue, which is really important, is being able to talk to other people um, about your feeling and about repression and oppression that are going on. And people encouraging and supporting each other to be able to be the totality of who they wish. Hi, this is Jim. Um, I, I think that 
I've certainly experienced at times that, uh, especially when I was dating in my younger days, that there were some people that I started to get involved with that I realized early on, I think felt like I was safe because they didn't think that I was interested in sex. And that's just where they were coming from. And um, at first I found that surprising. And, um, but I think that we learn so much from what we see in movies and on television. And we don't see people as sexy human beings or people that you want to be lovers with. Um, we, it's just not something that is shown as um, being it, it, not even discussed or palatable. And certainly, you, you know, I, you read, I read comments on the videos and such that have come out about the film. And, you know, you see a little bit here and there that people just think that the idea of being involved physically with somebody with a disability in, in, is disgusting. I mean, that horrible you know, uh, of a statement. And I think it's just because they don't see us for who we are and that there haven't been films that are similar to Nicole's and my film in regards to really letting you see people from the inside and really kind of experiencing something that um, is absolutely real. So much of Hollywood and that stuff, they just do things that are safe. And, you know, it used to be like on television, if you had somebody who was uh, African-American in, the, in, the, in the, the TV show, that it was just about that, that that's the reason they were in there. And we're slowly maybe getting away from that now in television, where we can just simply be seen as part of the everyday population. So, well, that's my two cents worth. Thank I you. think one of the things about camp also that was important is that it was an environment. Well, I think, let me say one thing also. Uh, one thing is there really was not fraternizing that was encouraged between the non-disabled staff and the disabled campers. And remember that this camp was, there were campers there who were older than campers at a non-disabled camp. Because typically in a non-disabled camp, you know, at the age of 15 or 16, campers begin to become camp counselors in training. They really, that did not exist. Toward the last couple of years in 71 when we were at camp, there were a few people who were doing work there, but that hadn't happened. So I think the environment for us as disabled individuals, um, we were teenagers and we were experimenting and we were not restricted. Well, we weren't, you know, we were not restricted in a way different than would have happened at other camps. And because we didn't have similar opportunities, many of us, um, you know, outside of the camp environment, I think, you know, the dance scene, you know, you could see in that dance scene how um, the sexuality of people there was really important. And you could also see, but you see over and over again, if you go to like the National Council on Independent Living, they have a dance every year. And many of these other groups have these dances where there are a lot of disabled people. And it's really like a once a year kind of environment where people can get together and really don't give a shit about what anybody else thinks about them. And um, I think your question is really important because the issue of sexuality is obviously more than sex. It's also how one feels about oneself. And if one doesn't include that as a part of who one is, I think it also weakens who the person is and their ability to truly be expressive. Thank you. I think my favorite clip, uh, you know, kind of that put all of the pieces together around like really addressing sexuality is that sexuality is normal and it's normal for everyone. But I love that the woman, I can't remember her name, did a shout out that she was like, I was having sex with the bus driver and then she later talked about, and I got gonorrhea and she was so proud of it. Where, you know, Denise. In, yeah, in Denise. healthcare, we usually are like trying to avoid people getting um, sexually transmitted diseases, but I actually was very proud of her. <laughs>
And then she went on to get her master's in sex. Yes. I loved it. I loved it. You know, Terry, um, this is Jim Lebrecht. Um, you know, you, you kind of say, you know, well, you know, sex is part of life. I think one of the things that um, that has kind of come up in our Q and A's and how we've been talking with Nicole and I have been talking with people on the road is that you got to think about disability as a natural part of life. Yep. It isn't this unexpected, oh my God, how could this possibly happen to me? But that between aging and simply just living life, that like I, you know, like I said, it's a natural part of life. And for me, that was really kind of a really different way of thinking about it, that I found a great deal of power um, as a disabled person to hear. I mean, I don't want to belabor this issue because we could have many hours of discussion. But I think one of the issues that goes on is um, when we're talking about sexuality and sex is everybody does expresses themselves differently. But for people who have certain types of disabilities, um, our bodies function differently. And I think in some way, my experience has been when talking with people, it, it's in part they want to know, do you do it and how do you do it? And so for me, I've always found it, if someone, if people don't ask the question in certain environments, I know that the discussion hasn't gone where it needs to go. And if they do ask the question, then I find it really important to be quite explicit, to be able to explain the differences in paraplegics and quadriplegics and people who have feeling and don't have feeling and move certain ways and blah, 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 to allow people, I think, in some way to also explore things that they could be doing as non-disabled individuals that they probably never thought about, that we do think about if we've had relationships with people who have different types of disabilities or we have different disabilities, obviously. Thank you, Judy. Um, I just wanted to do a time check-in for you guys. Um, obviously, um, for everyone on the call, um, especially if you have any, um, I would really like you to check in with yourself and make sure that after watching a film and being on a call for an hour with all of the stimulation, that you're okay. Um, if you need to leave, you should go, and um, and and know that this is going, this is being recorded, and it will be made public later, so you'll be able to watch the parts that you might have had to miss. Um, I, I I I have done this before, and we we still go on for hours, but I just really want to make sure everyone's checking in with themselves. Um, and to the panelists, um, are you guys okay to take a few more questions, or where are you? Where where are you with your with your day? Um, I've got so, a few more minutes. Okay, so there's a question from, um, so I guess uh, Jake, is Jake Sidwell still on the call? Yeah, Jake, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? And I, and I, I also think Jake, Jake and I met um, in part because he was um, in the documentary film Afflicted, which has sort of ended up being a, a masterclass in, in how not to tell stories about people with disabilities. Um, Jake, hi, how are you doing? Hey, Jen, I'm hanging in there. Uh, thanks for making sure everybody's checking in on themselves. I started to feel a little like I wanna hang out, but I'm, I'm, on the, I'm teetering on the edge. Um, is it okay to ask my question? Yes, please ask your question. Um, I'm going to read here because my memory is, I'm starting to forget what I even wanted to ask. Oh, I wanted to say, firstly, as a composer, I'm a composer for television, um, how delightful it, it, it was to hear music playing over disabled people that wasn't sad or heroic, that was just music, uh, a delight. Um, my question, though, uh, this is mainly for Judy, but uh, really anyone can jump in. I wanted to ask what you thought was the most important part of the current discourse around uh, disability and invisible illness. Um, one of the 
key things that I saw in the film that spoke to me was, Judy, when you were speaking to that uh, congressman whose name is eluding me, um, it felt like I was watching the news today. Um, it felt like I was watching the politicians today who are continuing to ignore us um, or continuing to ignore new boundaries that are trying to be pushed for um, similar issues that you guys pushed forward um, previously, which I'm so thankful for and have had the benefit of myself. So thank you. Um, but hearing things being said like we're collateral damage or um, you know, we're, we're expendable on this coronavirus and what's happening. Like we need to help these abled people so that they can get back to their normal lives. What do you think is the most important part for us as disabled or chronically ill or invisible illness, um, people with invisible illnesses? How should we go forward discussing this? And um, yeah, what's the key point there, do you think? I, I think Jen was, been talking about this during this discussion, and that is, you know, we all have different labels of our disability, but at the end of the day, I think we all need to identify as having a disability. And our disabilities impact us differently. But the issue is if we're all under one umbrella, and there also is an expectation that we learn from each other about um, the differences of our disabilities and how they impact us, so that we're able not just to you know, rely on you to tell the story of people who have invisible disabilities or illnesses, whatever you define them as. Um, you want me and other people to be able to speak about you like I want you to be able to speak about me. And so the ability to um, discuss how one feels, um, how one feels excluded, marginalized, the value of your life and what you are contributing and why it is important that we, we value each life individually. I think those are some of the discussions that need to happen. And as I was saying earlier, it's really, you know, you saw it a couple times in the film where I kind of get on the verge of wanting to cry. And I think it's, and I still do that today. And it really is spontaneous. It's nothing. You know, it's not like a rehearsed action. It's something that happens because I'm feeling emotionally something that I can't always even articulate. I think it's a combination of anger, frustration, embarrassment, humiliation, whatever. But I feel like that is something, regardless of our disability, that we need to talk about. And uh, when we talk about 56 million people, Obviously, we don't know everyone's story, but every every person with different types of disabilities, we need to see that we're part of a whole, both from a disability perspective, a racial perspective, religious perspective, sexual orientation perspective. Because I think we've got an amazing message to tell around the world that we are such a diverse and intergenerational group of people. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jake. Um, I think Lori has a question um, from someone on the Facebook Live, um, and I think this will probably be our last question um, before we devolve into a group discussion. Um, Lori, uh, do you want to ask Whitney's question? Yeah. Um, so Whitney is asking, um, having the physical space to come together at camp and then in Berkeley was so important to the movement. Now we can easily come together online like we are now. So how has the internet changed the disabled community and society's view of people with disabilities? How can those of us with ME build virtual community while we often can't leave our homes and our beds? And I guess maybe a question to add on to that is, do we, do we need a physical space? Like what? What what was the value of that, and what do we do if we don't have access to that? I gotta say, Jen, that um, as the the virus was um, starting to show its impact throughout the the country, that you know, I I very early on told people, by the way, Jen Brea not only you know made a film from bed at times but that she rallied 
hundreds and hundreds of people to um, to get politically active and, and find community. And that, and so the fact of the matter is, you know, we've been saying to people, it's like, oh, this is all new to you? Well, dang, we've been doing this for a long time. And, um, and, and so I think we are teaching, I mean, this is, you know, kind of a horrible moment to say that, well, you know, there's some lessons to be learned about the disability community. But um, uh, I think that for me, um, getting on Facebook about 10 years ago or so, all of a sudden connected me with so many other activists that I didn't know what they were doing or who they were. And that now I feel connected to some amazing uh, people, you know, throughout the world, actually, that, um, you know, so I'm really grateful for, for that. I have to say that um, I'm 72, and the reason I raise it is because I think some of this is intergenerational. You know, younger people are completely comfortable with social media, and I have to say that I don't have that same degree of comfort, um, but I am definitely trying to learn. So I think social media is very important. I think uh, even before uh, this particular problem arose, you, you have seen disabled people really using social media in a way that others maybe haven't with gaming and all types of things. So there are different discussions that are going on. So for me, this discussion is very important um, to be carried out as we're, through our usage of social media, uh, being able to have different discussions. I also think we have to look at how we train people on how to use social media. Um, because I think there are a lot of people who don't know how to use it. Um, I think there are issues of confidentiality and all types of things. So for me, you know, one of the issues with social media is when you're off by yourself, you can have a discussion. This is my perception, which is probably wrong. But I can have a discussion with another person which feels more private to me. That I wouldn't necessarily have that discussion. Um, on Facebook because you hear about things that never go away. And in the privacy, even of a telephone, you can do things differently. So I think this is a critical discussion that does emanate around. I mean, when I was growing up, telephone was my main resource because I couldn't go and visit other people. So I was always like the telephone queen. Um, now we've got additional tools how to discuss them, use them, make sure people have access to them and can be trained to use them and learn about the positives and the problems that we have to be careful about. Let me um, ask one final question and then I'll let you guys go. And I think we'll, what we'll probably do is, is keep this, con this conversation open and open it up to the community for anybody who wants to kind of keep chatting. And, and this is something I have, like before I, I, I co-founded ME Action, so, the, the, the rough like genealogy of my um, sort of uh, becoming an activist um, was um, I sat down one day and well actually that, that's not true I was in bed <laughs> I was in bed I got up I was still in bed I turned on Netflix and um, I watched How to Survive a Plague and I don't remember anymore why I did but I did and it was a history that I was only vaguely aware of because I was so young. Um, when it happened, and um, it 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 was the first time that I thought about the lack of access to healthcare as a human rights issue and a social justice issue. I didn't realize I was just this person going and trying to get help and falling down this dark well, and I was alone. And suddenly I realized, oh my gosh, like this actually isn't right. And the only reason why other people have the rights they do is because somebody fought for them before. And it, it, it opened my mind and I thought, well, if we could just do what, what AIDS activists did, but if we could find a way to do it virtually, then maybe we could get what we need. And we're kind of here five years later and we've done a lot of amazing community organizing. But we haven't yet gotten what we need. And I think, I think for me, the, the, the story, the sort of, um, the phrase I hear repeated a lot in the community and I don't want to totally reject this because there's so much truth to it, but a lot of people say we are too sick to advocate for ourselves. We need healthy people to advocate for us. 
Um, if we try to do what AIDS activists did, um, you know, we just we just can't, right? And and in the past, when we've done kind of in-person organizing, um, you know, oftentimes people crash, and it may take months for them to recover um, uh, their ability. And for some people, you know, there's some people who crashed after protests we did two years ago, and they were never the same. So that's the reality that we face. And at the same time, watching that hunger strike, I and and the 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 danger people put them in, um, put themselves in, and the risks they took with their bodies, while at the same time being supported, was just um, remarkable. So I guess my last question is like, to those of us who say that we're too disabled to fight for ourselves, what would you what, what would your response be? I would say no one should ever accept that as an answer. I mean, you've seen unrest, Judy, and you understand some of the challenges people face. No, no, I know that, but I'm not saying that someone is out there on the front lines 24-7, but you don't want someone to feel that your life is not of value. And therefore, um, however it gets expressed, through you or with someone else or you and someone else or a group, we need to be showing that we make contributions to ourselves, to our families, to our friends. You know, we're people of value. And we may have lots of limitations that narrow our world. Um, but I still feel like it is very important that no one ever feels that our disability is such that we don't matter. Because if we don't matter, then why are we fighting, you know, with the coronavirus that we have a right to live and, you know, be treated equally to other people? Yes, our lives, some of our lives are quite difficult, right? But everybody, I mean, you know, using yourself, Jen, as an example, and the film Unrest. The film Unrest is an amazing film for me because it shows the breadth of people and it shows the ebbs and flows and things that have gone on for people and research and various things that have enabled people, regardless of the type of disability, to do things that we weren't able to do before. So I I just think for me, I never, I mean, I ran an agency that worked with people with significant intellectual disabilities. And you never, ever wanted anybody to think that their disability was so significant that they weren't valued. That we didn't have responsibility to make sure that, that we had a responsibility to help them contribute what they could contribute. And if you look over the decades, and if you look at Willowbrook as an example, and people who lived in Willowbrook, if you look at people like with Down syndrome, and what people thought people with Down syndrome were able to do 40, 50 years ago and what's happened, you know, it's dramatically different. But there were thousands of people and still were institutionalized because, you know, people don't value that. And that's my only point. Thank you so much, Judy, for sharing that. And I think one of the things that I'm kind of taking away from this conversation is that maybe we shouldn't only be looking to people who are healthy or abled as our allies. Maybe we should look to people with other disabilities and that if we have a diverse community, we have different abilities so we can help each other, right? And you saw that so profoundly in the hunger strike um, where people were contributing in different ways and where the deaf people were contributing and people who, who couldn't be in the building but were outside the building, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that in that kind of fabric that we weave together, we have a different strength than we would if we were standing alone because maybe we do have profound disabilities, but they're different. And that means that we can contribute in different ways to the bigger picture. So thank you so much for that. Um, yes, Ben. Sorry, I, I know. know. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, people should go. There, there are so many. And uh, I'm Ben Sue Borger, campaigns director with Emmy Action. Uh, the film was amazing. There's so many different nooks and crannies and interesting parts to it. And I just at least want to recognize uh, one thing that I was, I felt like you snuck in the film um, and didn't really extrapolate on, but was really interesting to me was the the line about uh, veterans, disabled veterans, and uh, the interaction between. Uh, disabled people not getting the press coverage um, who maybe were disabled from birth or childhood. And then the the anti this other um, social movement, the anti-war movement going on, the type of coverage it was getting and the way you found like alliances or links to I, that just sounded like super fascinating. And I want to like learn more about it. So thank you for putting those Let things in. I'm just a very like, funny story. OK, this is funny. So we did a demonstration on Thursday. And we had no veterans, and the coverage was really pretty weak. So we called the, at that point, George McGovern was running for president against Richard Nixon. So we called George McGovern's office, and George McGovern's office got us two disabled veterans. One was a guy named Bobby Muller, who was uh, one of the three people, you know, speaking in D.C. at the Lincoln Memorial. He later went on to form an organization, and he was part of a group that won the Nobel Peace Prize around landmines. And he, <laughs> he had never done anything in the disability community. He, and you know, the veterans community frequently is another group that, for whatever reason, sees the, the disabled veterans. They're different. You know, each group sees ourselves different until we understand why it's important. To, to look at our similarities. But he talked about the demonstration that he joined where we walked up against traffic in Times Square as the looniest thing that he'd ever done. And then he met somebody you know, more wild than he was when we asked him to join us. So that, that's how we got the veterans. It was George McGovern's office. Thank you. I want to thank you so much, um, Judy, Nicole, Jim, for all of your time today, um, for making a gorgeous film that is um, an extraordinary piece of art, um, and for, um, for sharing your stories and for fighting for all of us, um, for yourselves, um, and, and, and both showing um, I think both showing an example that we're going to take forward as well as um, yeah, helping us remember the ways that you change the world so that we can all live in a, in a better, different world. So thank you so much. And we love you. I love you. Um, thank you for joining. Bye, guys. Thank, um, thank, you. thank you, Jen. Thank you for doing this. This was a blast. And Let's do it again. Get your film out there. Yeah, Jen, get yeah. your film out there much more. It's a My really film? powerful film. You oh, betcha. It's really, it's very important. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, she's talking about unrest. I'm sure everyone's seen it on this call at least. Bye. Thank you, guys.